We are going to be continuing in our Echo mini series, as Daniel mentioned. And it is a mini series because we do have Easter coming up in two weeks. That is, yes, yes, you can celebrate again. Resurrection Sunday, it is one of the greatest holidays that we have as believers to celebrate all that Christ has done for us. Amen. Amen. So this is a significant time for the church to echo the love of Christ. All right? All right, I'm going to poke y'all a little bit today. Is that okay? You guys mind if I poke you from up here? Anybody at all? How about if I poke you online? You guys can, you guys can put up the poke finger so you can see that you've been poked, okay? Because I might ask you to challenge yourself today. Is it okay to be challenged in church? Is it okay that we ask you to dig in a little bit deeper, to grow in your relationship with God, to come to know the areas you can do better as believers in? I think it is. I think it's really important. Elbow your neighbor and say, it is time to echo. Daniel said, echo, echo, echo. I'm just not as good at that. So you can echo in your seat. But this series, we are talking about the sounds, the expressions, the representations, and the impact that our lives and our choices have on others. Last week, he talked about how all of our lives make a sound. And this may make you cringe, but psychologically, I'm gonna tell y'all something, okay? You all right with that? Every single time your name is mentioned, okay? Anytime your name is mentioned to someone, each person will immediately either mentally envision something, think about a moment, but settle in on what they have decided to associate you and your life with. It is just the way the brain works. Maybe it's the car that you drive. Maybe it is the perfume or the cologne that you wear. Maybe it is the color of your hair or the length of your beard. Anybody in here? Can anybody relate to that? I mean, I know I can. What I have found to be so true is that it does not matter whatsoever. It's true because I'm doing the same thing right now. Like I can, I can pick out some orange hair across the room. We all do it. But the truth is it does not matter if anyone actually knows it's technically me because sometimes they just will assume, oh, orange hair, that's Jackie. For instance, St. Patrick's Day, was a, it was a pretty rough day for me, okay? <laughs> we received multiple, multiple reports of some woman with orange hair here in our wonderful Houston acting up all across the city and making me look bad because y'all, just because she had orange hair, she eerily looked a lot like me doing things I would not have ever done. But I still had people sending us these clips saying, is that you? What were you doing? And I'm like, no, I'm at home with my four children. I'm being a mom. That's not me. So if you saw that, it wasn't me, okay? Okay, it wasn't me. But that is just how it goes sometimes because the way the brain works this way, it makes quick connections and we do not have to always approve of the connections that our brain makes because maybe... Some people don't think about your hair or your facial hair or any portion of your outward appearance at all. Maybe when your name is mentioned, somebody thinks about the way that you made them feel. Maybe when your name is mentioned, what someone thinks of is what your response was when you welcomed them into your day, into your life. Maybe it was that when you said, how are you? They were surprised to really feel like you cared what their answer was. Maybe that is what someone associates with your life. The truth is that that one simple thought, that one simple thought that our brain takes us to is often determined. It determines how your life resonates in someone else's mind and heart. In that one moment. And maybe some of you would be sitting here or sitting at Cinco Ranch or the Woodlands, or even in Tanzania and Uganda, and maybe you would be thinking, oh, well, why does this even matter? Sounds like a whole lot of work to go to, to be so concerned about what other people are perceiving in my presence. Yeah, it's a good question. Some of you might be saying, well, I'm not a pastor, that's your job. It's your job to, to present Christ well. It's not my job. And others of you might even say, well, 
I mean, come on. Somebody at some point is gonna have a problem with something that I do or say, right? I mean, that's not a bad, it's not a bad question to ask. But I'm glad for those of you that are asking because I wanna take you to the word. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 20 and 21 says, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we, we, that's all of us, might become the righteousness of God. As ambassadors of Christ, as those with an understanding of what Christ has done for us because of his great love for us, we are seen as his representatives in this life. Just like y'all, don't you dare walk into Target in a red shirt and khaki pants thinking somebody's not gonna think you're a representative of the store and have an answer to their questions, right? If you are going into Target in a red shirt and khaki pants, somebody is eventually gonna ask you where the burgundy bath towels are. You're gonna have to answer one way or another. Maybe you know, maybe you don't, but they will assume you represent the store simply because of what you wear. Our lives are intended to be a beacon of hope to those that do not yet have the revelation of the love and the goodness of God. But here's where my gentle poke comes, okay? How do we do that though? If the lives that we live day to day don't represent the same kind of heart that Jesus carried. That's okay, you can clap. It's a question we should all think on. Daniel reminded us last week that an impacting echo from your life, an echo that leaves a long trail of influence behind it, it starts, it starts with faithfulness and with wisdom and with perspective, right? It was such a good word. If you missed it last week, I would encourage you to go back and watch. It was powerful. But we are gonna take it a step further today. We're gonna build on that incredible foundation that he laid and we're gonna talk about how your life's echo, how can we make your life's echo linger longer? Look at your neighbor and say, linger longer. It's a strange thing to say, okay? But that's why I made you say it, because I want you to think about it. Because the truth is, anytime, there are so many, there are so many different ways we can think about things that linger. Anybody ever been in a conversation with somebody and they just, oh, is really good at, at making that conversation linger a little longer than you feel comfortable with. Maybe a lot longer. Don't look around the room. It could be the person you're sitting right next to. But you know what I'm talking about, right? Right? Or how about if you've ever been out to eat with somebody and you realize in the moment, this person, they're really not wanting to pay for this meal at all. And you find that, man, this conversation has gotten deep now that the ticket has been laid on the table as if they are giving you the most kind, kind opportunity to offer to pay for the meal, right? Y'all, that is called the art of the linger. Anybody ever been, been victim to this before? Oh, it's a linger. It is a linger. Or how about one of my favorites? It's when you go to a big bonfire. Do we have anybody in here that loves a good campfire with s'mores and hot dogs? Come on, y'all. There's gotta be more than a couple. Thank you, thank you. I love it, but has anybody ever made the mistake of maybe not washing your hair or your beard or worn a different jacket the next day and you realize that the room that you're in, that everyone is doing the sniff check, like what exactly is on fire at the moment? Anybody ever been, ever been in there? Why? Because sometimes y'all, things just linger. I mean, anytime I take our children, it's not that often, okay? But anytime I take our children and grab them some kind of fast food, I can assume that the car the next day will smell as if something has died in our vehicle, right? Okay, it's simply because they shoved the rest of their uneaten burrito right under the seat and left it there to heat up. However, y'all know what I mean. Sometimes things linger. But as Christ followers, our lives should leave a sound that lingers 
that resonates, that lasts long before we've left the room, long before all the lights have been turned off, long before all of the conversations have ended, an echo that lingers. Ephesians 5.1 says, therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But how? How do we do that? How do I cause my echo to linger? Number one, this is the most important part. Number one is choose your sound. You have to make an active choice to choose the sound that your life represents. No one gets to tell you what the theme song of your life is, y'all. That is completely between you and God. I work every day to try to keep the, the song Happy by Pharrell Williams just floating around in my head. Yeah. This is what I hear on a regular day. <laughs> Not because my life is perfect, y'all. Not whatsoever, but because I want to choose to understand that God gets to write my story every single day. And I am grateful for that, y'all. So when I walk around, no matter how difficult life is, I am thinking, no, I am happy in the goodness of God. I am happy in the back seat with God steering this life. I'm grateful for that. That is the theme song that I choose. Now that doesn't mean that's the song that's playing all around me, okay? I've got four kiddos. I have plenty of opportunities to not be so happy. But that is the theme song that I choose. Never allow yourself, never allow yourself to be forced into a chapter of life that God did not identify as part of your adventure. Never. And when you find yourself in a spot where you feel that that is being forced upon you, you need to stop right where you are and say, no, God, you write my story. Nobody else writes this. Amen? Amen. We walk in the authority and the understanding that we have a choice to live our lives following after the creator of heaven and earth. And that is what we get to do because when the countenance of your life reflects confidence in God, Confidence in God and his plan and in his ways. There is an echo of joy that comes off of your life that you just can't fake. You can't just say, no, I'm happy. I'm happy. I'm happy. I'm happy. I'm happy. Things are good. No, there's a joy that just comes right off of you because you are confident, not in your circumstance, not in your abilities. You are confident in your God. And there's a joy that echoes from that. Amen. Amen. The sound of your life either happens on purpose because it represents what you know God has called you to be and at least you're a work in progress towards that or it just sounds like noise, just sounds like distraction, just sounds like clutter, just sounds like somebody else's life. Anybody ever felt like that in a moment? Like whose life, whose life am I living right now? Where am I? What's going on? And that is typically a product of a sound that wasn't chosen, but more absorbed like a sponge from the atmosphere around you. I can promise you, any of you in this room that have children, you've never sat your kids down and said, hey, hey, honey, now make sure that you listen to every word spoken over you and let them tell you exactly who you are, right? No, we teach our children, you learn to hear from the voice of God. Let's take you to the word. Let's teach you what the word says about who you are. And then we're going to hold on to that. Nobody else takes that from you, right? So why do we struggle with that as adults? Why do we walk around like sponges just soaking up everybody else's lives? Why don't we recognize the power we have to choose to be who God has called us to be and leave the impact that God has called us to. Because I don't know about you, but I don't want to be coincidental with my life, not for a moment. Our worst, a bystander in my own story? No, thank you. No. Ephesians 2.10 says, for we are his workmanship created. That means workmanship means something that was intentionally made, created, handcrafted. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk 
in them. We were all created on purpose for a purpose, and that is to carry the message of Christ, to be messengers of hope, and we are not going to get it right every single time. But we have to make intentional choices along the way. Romans 15, 13, one of my very favorite scriptures, but if you listen to me, you'll hear me say that about so many of them. But Romans 15, 13 says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. Stop right there. It doesn't say, it doesn't say that the joy and the peace that you have yourself will come first and then you trust in him afterwards, does it? It says the joy and peace of God will fill you up as you trust in him. That means that as we are trusting God with our life, he fills us up with joy and peace as a product of the choice we make to trust in him, amen? Amen, and then the second part here, the second part says, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Do you know what the great thing is about overflowing? That means that the joy and the peace that you needed on the inside for your life, the strength that you needed filled you up, and then you had so much left to overflow out of you to be a blessing with joy and peace to all of those around you and point them to the God of hope because of it. Overflow is not ours. Overflow is for the others, the lives that we encounter, the people that we impact. Amen. You can clap. It's good. So if we get to choose our sound and we are called to represent Christ, how do we do that? I think the best place to start is in Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. It's a long list, right? It's a long list of how do I do all of that? How do I do all that? We lean on and we trust in God to do that. But look at this. Fruit, by definition, is a byproduct of something that is healthy and growing, right? So growth is the thing that we are looking for as we look to the fruit of the Spirit to lead us. When the Spirit of God lives within us, there should be fruit. There should be fruit of the Spirit of God. Amen. Evidence of the presence of Jesus, not signs of perfection, y'all. I'm not saying that when you have Jesus in your life, you'll be perfect. Know what I'm saying is there will be evidence. There will be an overflow of something. If you allow Jesus to be the Lord of your life, where the Spirit of God is given liberty in our lives to be our God and to lead us to become greater within us, these fruit should be seen. They should be evident. For me personally, I can look back at my life and I can think of these different moments in my life where the echo of the Spirit of God through someone else's life impacted me. And it caused me to wanna to choose to be changed by the presence of God that I encountered in each of these people. I wanna show you something. I have this trusty cart over here. Y'all are gonna have to listen as I pull it over like a fruit stand lady. <laughs> but I want you to see something here. This is my bag. Okay, this is... This is a lovely Hope City bag, by the way. All proceeds go to missions, by the way. You can grab them out in the lobby. However, it's a wonderful bag, okay? But this bag represents my life. This bag represents my choices. This bag represents the things that I choose to carry in this life. And I have a bowl of fruit here. And this bowl represents the fruit of the Spirit. But also at these different points in my life, I have been marked by people demonstrating the fruit of the Spirit. When I think about the love of God, symbolic of this apple, when I think about the love of God, it takes me back to a moment in life where I came to an understanding of how real the love of God was for me individually in my life. And I can link it to my youth pastors. Their names are Dave and Peg. Long, long time ago, they were my youth pastors. But when I was in junior high and high school, I was in a spot in my life where I didn't know who I was in Christ. And I needed to know the love of God. And because of God's goodness, he showed me his love through these two specific people. And you know what it caused me to do? 
It caused me to say, oh, I, wanna, I wanna live a life that loves people like that. And I chose in that moment to say, I wanna carry the love of God like that. I wanna carry the love of God like that. And then the joy of the Lord. When I think about the joy of the Lord, I legitimately, not because they're perfect, but I legitimately think of my kiddos, specifically my Daphne, my five-year-old. Okay, so if you have ever encountered my Daphne, anytime she walks into a room or anytime you walk into a room, the way that she enters the room, my Finley's sitting over here. She's like, what about me? You are full of joy too, and I love it. You taught her. You taught her how to do it. She walks into a room like this, literally. Literally, I'm not even kidding. This is the way that she enters the room. Anybody that knows her will giggle right now because the truth is there is no way that you can be greeted like this and not feel some kind of joy, not feel like, ah, life's not that serious. And every time I see that little countenance that says, hello, I literally think I wanna have that kind of joy. I want to have the joy that my five-year-old carries. Amen? Because it's a joy that says, ah, God's good. This is going to be good. How are you? But every time I encounter that, I literally say, I want to carry that kind of joy. I want to carry that kind of joy. When I think about the peace of God, I think about my grandmother who lived here in Houston, Texas, where I spent all my summers and literally how I came to love Galveston. Yes, we love Galveston. Come on, come on. We're not worried about any rashes. We love our Galveston. <laughs> but when I think about the peace of God, I think about my sweet grandmother who passed away when I was 17 years old. And she passed away with congenital heart disease. And it was a really rough, rough season of years in her life. She lived a life of pain. She lived a life of unanswered questions. She lived a life that was really, really challenging. But what I gleaned from my grandmother was a confidence in God, a peace that came from her faith that said, God's got me. I'm at peace. I will live and walk in peace because God is for me. He is not against me. So who cares whatever else happens? Amen. And because of that example of peace in her life, every time I encountered my grandmother, I thought, ah, I want to know the peace of God like that right there. When I think about the patience of God, I think about a woman, it's a large mango here, y'all. I'm doing some reps over here. When I think about the patience of God, I think about a woman my age who has six children on purpose. Her name is Selena. They are little, little stair-stepped kids, just one right after another. And we call them, anybody that ever encounters them, they call them the little duckies because she's such a woman of patience that her children are just like, yes, mommy, wherever you would like to go, let's go. We're ready to go. We are so happy and grateful because life is so good. And they carry this patience because their mother seems to be a saint. Literally, she's a real person. But you wouldn't know it sometimes because she carries so much patience that does not come from her nature. You can make that excuse easily. I don't care what your personality type is. That is not the kind of patience that comes from a person. It only comes from the Father. Yeah, Amen. And every time I have ever encountered Selena, I think, okay, I've got a lot to learn in the area of patience. Amen? But Lord, don't make it a rough lesson. Just teach me how to be more patient. I'm impatient even in my request to be more patient. But when I think about the kindness of God, I'm reminded of this one particular moment. Now, y'all, I have four children. I don't remember a lot of things that I'd like to remember, okay? Can anybody support me in that? There's a lot else that happens in this brain. So these memories, I'm not making them up on the spot. They marked me. There was a moment where I was shown the kindness of God when I was pregnant with my first child. And I was very pregnant. We were in Michigan. It was really, really snowy outside. I just finished grocery shopping. I had put all of my groceries in there. My sweet husband was not with me. And I now was standing in this parking lot all the way out at the end of it with an empty cart and a parking lot full of snow and ice. And I was faced with the decision to return the cart or not. To return the cart or not. And everything in me wanted to say, you're pregnant. Everybody would understand. But the other side.
side of me, which I'll still give you that excuse if you didn't make the same choice that I did. But the other part of me was aware that if I leave this cart right here in the middle of a snowy parking lot, I could cause an accident. So I turned around and I said, okay, I'm returning, returning the cart. So I was taking the cart back. And this man is yelling to me from all the way back at the store, ma'am, 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 no, stop, stop, stop. And he runs all the way out on the snow and ice. And he says, no, let me take your cart. Let me take your cart. And I'm like, I don't, okay, okay I, don't, I don't know you at all. And he's like, no, 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 have a wonderful day. And I was so blessed by his kindness. But do you know what was even more of a blessing to me? When I found out later, he was a pastor across town and he did not have to know who I was. He just knew it was his mission to live out the kindness of Christ. Amen. And I got back in my car that day and I said, I need to be kind like that. My goodness, that's the kind of kindness that we all should live like. I think about the goodness of God. I literally think about somebody that you all know really well. That's my sweet husband. And I do not say that to say, oh, everything is so perfect, y'all. We're so, everything is wonderful. No, I say that to say that I literally, from the moment that I have had the blessing of being married to him, I have gotten to experience the goodness of God through his choices to be my husband every day. Amen. You can clap for that. The reason it's so significant and so substantial is because when you're married, you get to see the ugliest of everybody. You get to be the most familiar with that person. And usually you can put on a smile for the day and then go home and be like, well, all right. Now I'm ready to let my hair down. However, I've seen the goodness of God in my husband in the way that I, I could probably count on one hand the amount of times I filled up my own gas tank because he takes great joy. You can clap. He takes great joy in an awareness that I am fully capable. However, he never wants me to have to do that if he can do it for me. It's pretty impressive, y'all. True story. And there's not a day that I don't go to bed at night with my little cup of vitamins sitting on my nightstand and my cup of water that he puts there before I'm ready to go to bed so that I don't have to do it. Yes, you can say, oh, what a man. He's a good man. But what a gift to be able to say, I've experienced the goodness of God in my spouse. I want to be that kind of spouse, right? I want to be the kind of partner that leaves my husband at the end of the day thinking, man, I saw the goodness of God today in my wife. It's a great, it's a great example. When I think about the faithfulness of God, I'm reminded of my sister who, when she went off to college, she's six years older than me, and I was still in junior high, still trying to figure out what on earth I'm supposed to do now that you've left me, sis. She went off to great adventures, and instead of recognizing how I was struggling to know who I was in Christ, instead of recognizing how I was feeling really, really alone in that young season of my life, she went off to her adventure and she was faithful to send me a card in the mail. We did use the mail back then, guys. <laughs> Big deal. But she would send me a card in the mail every single week with a scripture telling me who God said I was, telling me who I was to be in Christ and reminding me of my value. Because of that, I learned about the faithfulness of God. Because of that, I learned that God will not leave the one just because he's already got the 99. Because of that, I knew the faithfulness of God in a way that made me say, I want to carry that kind of faithfulness. I want to know that kind of faithfulness. When I think about the gentleness of God, I think about a pastor that we encountered in our years of preaching and traveling. And this pastor was not like any other. His name was Pastor Jim, still is, in Ohio. But he carried so much gentleness. He was that person that when he asked, how are you, looked in your eyes, and you literally were like, oh, oh wait, 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 oh, oh, golly, you got me. I'm good, I'm good, all is good. Because you could see the gentleness that cared. You could see the gentleness that wanted to know, hey, do you know, do you know Jesus? Is he 
leaving a mark on your life? Are you allowing him to, to change you? And the gentleness that he carried made me, made me say, I could use a little more gentleness in my life. And lastly, it's so funny that it's the biggest one, but really it's because it's the hardest one is self-control, y'all. Self-control. I can't put any sweet, just delightful story to this. This was my lesson of not to eat pizza every single night in college, literally. This was my college roommate that said, ah, you're gonna need some self-control in life. It will benefit you down the road. We can make better choices. When I was in college, I had no clue I was gonna have four children and the self-control I was going to need down the road. I had no idea. But in that season of my life, the Lord reminded me, you're gonna need to practice more self-control. And you know what? It was a good lesson. It's never an easy lesson, but it was a really, really good lesson. You see, I can carry the heart of God with me because of the fruit of the Spirit that I have experienced through others. And I am sure that you could also, if you really sit down and you take the time to think about it, the echo of that representation of Jesus through their life caused me to want to choose to be changed by the presence of Jesus. This bag, y'all, is full. It's full of the type of spiritual fruit that will last and will continue to produce a healthy harvest in my life and everyone that I encounter because it represents not me, but the heart of Jesus right here, right here. But there is another bag. There's another bag. I said the sound that you carry is a choice. You have a choice of what your sound looks like. This bag over here, as you can see with my friend Anthony, he's working to actually hold that bag. It has a lot heavier weight to carry than this little bag right here that I'm carrying, just walking around, enjoying life, whistling while I go. He's working to hold on to this bag because do you know what this bag represents? This bag represents the noise. It represents the ill words. It represents all the collections of rejection. It represents the doubt, the hurt, the fears, the pains that you've experienced in life. And sometimes without realizing it, that sponge that I talked about before, sometimes we pick up that bag and we don't realize how we're struggling like Anthony is. We don't realize how heavy the load is that we're carrying because we just absorbed some stuff instead of saying, I don't have to carry that. I don't have to carry that. Amen. Y'all, that is not a sound that we want to carry. Pain produces more pain. Hurt produces more hurt. Lies produce more lies. But when you choose the truth of God, you walk in a different kind of light, a different kind of freedom, a different kind of confidence, a different kind of joy that says, this is my bag to carry. And it might come with some bumps in the road, but I know that I have the strength inside of it to get me through every single storm. I choose to carry the sound of Jesus so that my life can bear fruit for others as well. Amen? Amen. Amen. Thank you, Anthony. Can y'all give him a hand? Amen. Amen. So number one, choose your sound. Number two, align your words with your actions. In other words, y'all, you can say it out loud. You got to practice what you preach. We have to be people that follow up with action to the words that we say. It is so very important that if you want to give some rules on life, if you want to talk about these things that you should be without living it, then you will not be seen as anything other than legalistic and hypocritical. That is not who the church should be any longer. It is time for us to rewrite that narrative, y'all. It is well past time. And again, that is not a representation of perfection. It's a representation of the power of God. 
It is so valuable that the words we speak bring life, give hope, and charge faith. And then that the lives we live, that they should echo that same hope, that same joy, that same faith to see those mountains move instead of just talking about them, right? We want to see them move. An echo begins with the words you allow to come out of your mouth. But don't be fooled into believing for one moment that an echo will continue if all you paid Jesus was your lip service and none of your life service. Not for a second. That echo stops right there. There is no residual behind that echo at all. Value is placed on your convictions when you put feet to your faith. Fruit of the Spirit is both a verb and a noun because it represents an action. James 2.26 says, For as the body apart from the Spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. We have to live our lives like someone is with us all the time because he is. He's the Holy Spirit. And he is not there to shame you because of your mistakes. He is there to strengthen you through them. He is there to empower you to do better. John 14, 26 says, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Align your words with your actions. And number three, do the hard things. It's an easy statement and a really hard task. We have to do the hard things because what's the, what's the natural inclination when we face something hard? Like to tiptoe out of the circumstance, right? Right? But we are not called to tiptoe backwards for any moment. We have to face the difficult challenges. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of what? But of power and of love and of a sound mind. There's not a season in your life that you will not be strengthened by those. If you turn from fear, if you turn from that bag you don't need, and you turn to the Lord, don't be afraid of a mirror. Too often we look in a mirror and we look at the choices that we've made, we look at the mistakes that we've made, and we say, ah, oh, messed up, a failure, I can't do it, I quit. But a mirror is simply an opportunity for growth. And growth is our opportunity to get better in the presence of God, to be more effective for the kingdom of God, to do what you are called to do more successfully. Don't shrink back when the road looks uncertain. Press into the presence of Jesus. Find the power in the Holy Spirit and let the Lord tidy up the messy places in your life so your echo doesn't die when it meets your reputation. We don't want that, right? The fruit in your life will speak volumes because of how miraculous his redemption is. Not because of how great you are, y'all. Not because of the fruit that you produce or the great garden you've got, but the fruit in your life will speak to the testimony of how powerful God is. He can change them. He can do that in her. Man, he must be, he must be a good God. And the last thought I want to leave you with, an echo happens after a sound is produced. Yes? Yes? But an echo doesn't happen with every single sound that's made, right? Right? You're hearing my voice, but you don't hear an echo in this moment. Because by definition, the sound has to encounter a hard surface in order for it to reflect back in the direction that it came from. That's what makes an echo. So an echo lingers and it continues on when it comes in contact with a hard surface. Why is that significant? It means your impact your influence, the testimony of your life travels the farthest when the need is the greatest. When you encounter a place in life that needs Jesus the most, the echo that is on your life will echo off the farthest. The fruit of the Spirit in your life will echo in the hard places and the hardened hearts until the love of Jesus has an open door to soften it. What if the sound that we carry could be that of the heart of Jesus, of fruit? What if 
What an impact we could have, what an impact could be had on you if Christians could live and act in the same manner as the heart of God. Jesus himself said in Mark 16, 16, to go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. He said, go into all the world, not just the corners that look like your corners, not just the places you're comfortable with. Give of yourself and your resources until you're uncomfortable. Because in that place, it's no longer you that lingers. It's his redeeming peace. It's his overwhelming joy. And it's his lasting fruit. Amen? Amen. Would y'all stand to your feet? We are gonna go back into that chorus very quickly because we want our lives to be all for your glory, Lord. Would y'all sing this? Would you sing this chorus through with us one more time? of your love, that our lives would reflect your heart and your nature and your spirit. God, all for your glory, that you would be glorified in our lives. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you would challenge us, take the time to encourage us to know you more, to go to greater depths with you, Father, and to be changed in your presence. If you're in this place with every head bowed and every eye closed, If you're in this place, maybe you're one of two different people. Maybe the first one is you would say, all of that sounds wonderful. To live in love and joy and peace and kindness and goodness. To know a savior that would leave 99 to come after me. But I don't know Jesus as the Lord and savior of my life. And I want to experience that freedom and that deliverance and that love of a father that cares about me and knows me by name, the father that I'm seen by. The second is for those maybe that are in here and would say, yeah, I've, I've known the love of God like that. I've walked with him, I've pursued him, but something happened in my life or on my journey and I turned from him and I am far from God right now and I want to rededicate my life and get my life back on track with the one God the only true God who saves, delivers, and heals. If you are either of those two people right in here, online at Cinco Ranch at the Woodlands in Uganda, in Tanzania, if you are one that is ready to surrender your life to Jesus or ready to rededicate your life, 
right now in an act of surrender and boldness, I ask you to slip your hand up before the Lord. He's the only one that can see you. Yes, we see your hands. Raise your hand if you would like to surrender your life to Jesus. Can we celebrate, church? We see you. I see you, I see you. We see you. Yes, hallelujah. Would everyone with their eyes closed, would you all say this prayer with me? Would you say, Jesus, today is my day. I wanna give you my life. I ask you for forgiveness of all my sins. Thank you for forgiving me. I repent. And from this moment on, I am choosing to live for you. You are my Father. I receive you as my Savior and you are my Lord. In Jesus' name, Jesus. amen, amen.